Hello everybody, welcome back to the 4K Lowdown, and today I'm doing my biggest video ever. I'm looking back at the full year of events in Warhammer 40k, picking out the most important ones in a bit of detail and giving my opinions on the notable points. Uh, this is gonna, probably going to be a, a pretty lengthy video, uh, so sit yourself comfortably and we'll begin way back in January. So the very first thing that was announced in 2017 was uh, the boxed game Gangs of Camorra. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's the Dark Eldar thing. So it contained uh, Hellions and Reavers, and I never actually played the game, and I don't really know anything about it or how it actually plays. But what I do know inside is that the models inside were insanely good value, because I think that the Reavers alone made up uh, more than the cost of the box. So I think people bought it for the models rather than just like to play the game. Um, I think that's a common trait. It, I mean, a common trait, in my opinion, in the Games Workshop uh, boxed games is that the models included uh, don't really fill the cost, but this uh, was definitely not the case with Gangs of Kimura, because I think it showed us that early on in 2017 that it was going to be a good year for us. Um, and as we went uh, into 20, 2017 from 2016, uh, the Gathering Storm narrative had been heavily teased, uh, and not long into January, the, the release date of the Fall of Cadia book and the Triumvirate of the Imperium box was announced. Uh, this was, of course, the starting point for the entire narrative of 8th edition um, that so many of us uh, are loving exploring now. Um, so with the reveal of the three new characters, uh, called Celestine and Greyfax, a lot of excitement spread through the community uh, in anticipation of what was to come. Um, in my opinion, The Gathering Storm was one of the best ideas that Games Workshop have ever had, because obviously it paved the way for a huge surge in playership that 40k was going to see over the course of the year. Um, and over the rest of January, we saw close looks at the Triumvirate characters uh, and loads more hype building posts uh, on Warhammer community before the final fall of Cadia finally dropped and the 40k universe was sent into chaos. Um, in my about six years of playing the game, I've never seen so much audience discussion than in the days after the books dropped, the, the book dropped, and as people sort of came to terms with the fact that the narrative was finally moving on uh, in such a big way. Um, in the second half of the month, we saw the announcement and teasing for part two of the Gathering Storm, which was the fracture of Bealtan, and this got Eldar players, um, who along with all the Xenos players, were feeling a bit left out after. Uh, for Arcadia, uh, got excited because their faction was coming back into the limelight with a new box set and some new narrative. Um, so we had a bumper first month for 2017, but the year had only just begun and there was still, still loads we had absolutely no idea was coming. The early days of February saw the release of the Fracture of Bealtime book and the Triumvirate of You Need. Um, but these otherwise exciting events were hugely overshadowed by probably the biggest news in Warhammer 40k ever, I'd say, uh, and it was that Rebute Gulliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines, was back, and this, of course, I'm sure everyone remembers, sent the community into absolute raptures of applause. Uh, obviously, there were some dissenters who didn't want him back or something like that, but I remember I was personally very excited by the news, uh, and I didn't even play Space Wind at the time. Um, the announcement of the return of Gulliman coincided with the announcement of the final book of the Gathering Storm, The Rise of the Primarch. Um, and in the days before the reveal, the hype among the community was immense. And then, one of after that massive, momentous event, uh, one of the most strangest events of the year occurred. Uh, PTA, or Peter, I, I don't know if you say Peter, but the animal cruelty people, um, try to get Games Workshop to stop having their models wearing fur. Um, I think this bewildered almost everyone, whether they played Warhammer or not. It did get a, a fair bit of coverage in the media, like the, the mainstream media, from what I saw, um, and because it was just completely pointless. And I'm not sure why Peter thought that GW would even be bothered. Um, in typical style of the new Games Workshop, we've become accustomed to um, they responded with a humorous regimental stand on the issue, and then it was never really talked about again. Uh, so February was one of the most momentous months ever in terms of story for Warhammer 40k. Um, 
more had happened in those two months than in the previous 30 years in terms of story. Um, but there was still so much to come in the rest of the year and lots more excitement. The start of March saw the release of Gilliman's model, uh, to much controversy over whether the model was any good, uh, like looks wise, but mostly people, as I remember, were just excited to be able to play uh, with the first loyalist Primark in Warmer 40k. And the hype train from it barely died down when another super exciting announcement was made, uh, Shadow War Armageddon. And this got a lot of people excited whether they played the old Necromunda or not, because it was a new game. Uh, based on the classic rule set, which definitely appeals to a, a large audience. Um, and the back end of March saw the Adeptus Custodies return to Warmer 40k in the, uh, the Talons of the Emperor box. And I've never even considered buying any Custodes, and I rarely see them on the table, so I'd be interested to see the sales figures to find out whether it's just my local scene that lacks them. Um, but I would like to have some opinions on whether anyone actually plays with Custodes. Um, yeah, and then on the 23rd, uh, the Games Workshop press conference at Adepticon brought us some of the biggest news of the year. Um, we essentially found out that Games that, uh, 8th edition would be arriving later in the year, and they also told us that Death Guard were getting new models, uh, leading to rampant speculation about the new start box and the new edition. And they didn't say explicitly that a new edition was on the way, but they released new, big new rules concepts, so it was pretty clear. Um, I was very excited for the new edition, despite the fact that I enjoyed 7th more than many people. Um, but I was obviously, as a lot of people were, uh, slightly apprehensive. Because the edition I played before 7th was 5th, and that was because 6th was such a mess. Um, and I was worried the game would just go downhill again, and the player base might collapse like it did with 6th uh, edition. Um, yeah, so March delivered news that would shape the entire rest of the year and for the rest of uh, 40k forever, I'd say, uh, as the hype train rolled along right up until release day. Uh, but the, there was a lot more surprises in store before 8th edition was even released. Up until the end of it, April was a pretty empty month in my opinion. Uh, we got the official announcement of 8th edition that everyone knew was coming already, along with a few extra bits for Shadow War Armageddon. Uh, but in the final few days of the month, the first of many, many, many hype teaser, hype building teaser articles emerged from Warhammer community. Um, this was the new galaxy map showing a massive rift in the middle. Um, and the, this new dominance over the galaxy by the warp created more questions than uh, that it answered. And I'd say this is probably the aim, because they didn't really explain that much about what was going on in the map. Um, I can't really remember my initial reaction to it, uh, to the map, but it has become an integral part of the new narrative, and I'm a fan of how it's moved along the story. Uh, on the same day as, as the map, we also found out about the uh, three ways to play system, which uh, people who played Sigmar were already uh, semi-familiar with. And uh, this caused a lot of controversy. Um, I personally wasn't that bothered, and I thought I'd just carry on playing with points, um, although I now almost exclusively uh, play with power, um, because it's just a lot easier, because building points lists is really time consuming now. Um, however, many people were outraged at what they perceived to be the, uh, the sigmarification, if that's the word, uh, of 40k, and to an extent I agreed, and I still do agree. But I think that 40k is still a noticeably different game, in my opinion, from Sigma, and I think it is a better game as well. Um, also, on this same day, it was a, a big day for 40k, uh, Games Workshop released perhaps the most un-Games Workshop article of all time. Um, they announced that if you had bought a codex within the previous eight weeks, then you were going to get a refund for it. And I was honestly astonished at this because, to my knowledge, Games Workshop had never done anything like this before, and for them to be not clawing money away from people for once, that was a real change in form. Um, just one day after this, the writers had, must have sent themselves into overdrive, or been writing for months previously to uh, get articles ready, uh, we got an article about the new unit profiles, and this showed us that, in general, the units were going to have more wounds, and the article the next day showed us that guns would be doing more damage. And this gave us the first real impression that the game was going to be played at a faster pace, 
than previous editions. Um, the back end of April also saw the release of the much anticipated Dawn of War 3 to a, a very mixed reaction. I've never played any of the Dawn of War games, uh, I don't really like that style of game very much, um, so I can't really give an opinion, but I know the game was not well received. Um, over the coming months, there was an article pretty much every day teasing a new feature or a new rule for the new edition, so I won't bore you going through every single one, but over the, the coming months, um, or the coming months in this video, I will uh, I'll look at the main ones and some of the notable ones that gave you some the really big uh, important announcements that they put out. The final day of the month uh, brought a teaser for one of the most controversial parts of the new edition, uh, the Primaris Marines. And I was personally really excited for this teaser, by this teaser. Um, and I could not wait for the official announcement of the new Space Marines and I was not disappointed with how they looked. Um, so April carried on the momentum of the previous months uh, when it got into the back end and the daily articles about the impending new edition grew hype around the, uh, the edition and the game even further. Um, we were all desperate to know what would the coming months bring for our game. <clears throat> the early days of May brought us new articles on the charge and fight phase of the new edition, but what really excited some people about the first few days uh, was the release of rules for the legend Slime Arbo, and although he wasn't as powerful as many may have liked, at least he was available to use. Uh, of course now we've got, or depending on when you're, when you're watching this, we have a model, a new model for Slime Arbo, and we'll have new rules uh, if you're watching this after Boxing Day. Um, so yeah, the next article that was of major interest in the month, uh, major interest to me at least, was the introduction of detachments because I, like many casual gamers, uh, was a bit annoyed by the Death Stars you could create using formations and other exploits uh, in 7th edition, so I was glad to see formations go. Um, I also hoped that as well as stopping Death Stars, that detachments would reward you for using more fluffy lists, um, like building a narrative list, but that hasn't really happened, unfortunately for me. Um, we also found out that any weapon could harm any unit, and I, like quite a few people, was a bit worried about this because I thought that sort of Bane Blades were going to be brought down by last guns on a, a regular basis, but thankfully that's not really happened. Um, your last guns and your bolters are rarely going to be doing damage to big tanks. Um, May also brought us the first faction focuses um, and gave us our first decent glimpse at the armies in the new edition, um, but it was a new faction that really got the community going. Um, and it was the information about the Primaris Marines, uh, and it included a good look at the models, and sort of reassurance that Primaris would not be replacing the old Marines completely. And I absolutely loved the new sculpts um, from the first time I saw them, but loads of people have this ir ir sorry, irrational, in my opinion, dislike, and I've never really understood the hate of the Primaris Marines, but I think it just stems from people not wanting change and not wanting to move forward. Um, which I think is a bit strange, but anyway, by the far the biggest event of May for me was the announcement of the release date of the new edition, and this sparked a real ramp up in the hype train that had already been rolling pretty fast throughout the year, and I remember getting pretty hyped myself even though I quite liked 7th edition. Uh, the end of May also let us see the contents of the much anticipated and speculated about Dark Imperium set, and although I knew I wouldn't be buying it, um, I was very impressed by the box, and I have subsequently bought the Primaris side of it, uh, and started the new Primaris army. Yeah, so the month of May uh, was where we finally got a date uh, to focus our hype on, but would the addition live up to it? Uh, June would be the month when we would find out. The 3rd of June saw pre-orders go live for the new edition, two weeks before the release. And apart from the seemingly endless faction focuses and designer interviews and other articles on Warhammer community, we were told about a brand new global campaign that would be taking place uh, shortly after the release of the new edition. It was called The Fate of Kono. And I've never played in a, I, ha I had never played in a global campaign before, so I was pretty excited about the idea of being able to influence the narrative of the game by playing games. Uh, but more on The Fate of Kono, we can't, we more on the fate of Korno later on, uh, because a week later the new edition was on the shelves. 
and Alpha One was super, super excited by the new rules, and the general consensus early on was very good. I remember, I think I played uh, the new edition on the day just after its release, or maybe the day after that, I'm not sure, I can't quite remember. Um, but I remember my game store being buzzing with excitement that we had a new edition and it wasn't terrible. I remember that the store was packed and people were just playing games, getting into the new rules. Um, my first and largest impression about the game was just how much faster it went. Everything died very quickly, which obviously I had mixed feelings about, but I and the community overall uh, was pretty happy. And just a week after new rules hit stores, we got a wave of announcements about upcoming Primaris and Death Guard releases, including the infamously expensive Primaris characters. So June was probably most one of the most exciting and important months in 40k for many, many years, and probably many years to come. It saw the release of the most hyped edition of 40k ever, and brought a whole new generation of space me to the tabletop. Surely the second half of the year couldn't top this, could it? In early July, perhaps the most perplexing announcement for me was made. Everyone was going to be getting a new codex in the near future. And this kind of annoyed me because I'd just dropped £15 on an index. And in a matter of, a matter of months, um, it would be outdated and not really relevant. I can't remember the reaction to the announcement of imminent codices. Um, so I'd be grateful if you could put in the comments what you thought about it. Um, and perhaps continue to think about the implementation of codex as codices. Um, Mid-July gave us another Primaris announcement, which a new Dreadnought. And at first, I wasn't a big fan of the Redemptor, uh, because I thought it looked sort of too futuristic, which kind of sounds weird considering it's a future game, but I think a lot of people know what I mean by that. Um, but it has grown on me over the months since July, and I quite like it now. Uh, and with the release of the easy build kits, I might be getting one for my Primaris. Um, I actually quite like all the Primaris models, apart from those goofy snowshoeing, snow, snowshoe wearing in, inceptors. Are they inceptors? I think so. Um, the end of July saw the start of the Fate of Kuno campaign, which I've been pretty excited for. And I think this part of the video is the ideal part for me to give my opinions on the Fate of Kuno. And I would be interested as well to see what you thought of it. Um, so from the start, I think everyone sort of knew that the Imperium would win. The Imperium is just so much bigger than any other faction, um, players-wise, and I, for one, was pretty sure of the eventual, out eventual outcome. And for the first three weeks, uh, that went with our prediction, and Chaos didn't even come close to winning any regions, which made their victories in weeks four and five. Uh, those actually happened in August, but uh, it makes sense to have it here. Um, all the more perplexing. Um, there were sizable calls from people in the community that the campaign was basically being rigged in those weeks to make the last week more interesting. And I'm honestly fairly convinced by these conspiracies. Um, because I remember that I've seen screenshots of like one minute before the end of the camp, uh, like the end of the week um, on the campaign page and Imperium had been winning and then it was announced that Chaos had won. Um, so it was a bit... Uh, it was difficult to believe that Chaos would win like they did. Um, yeah, so another one of my feelings about the fate of Kono is that it hasn't really affected the narrative like we were told it would, and I'm extremely disappointed by that. Um, I would like to know what you would think about that as well. Uh, July also had time to fit in two more Primaris announcements, uh, the Aggressors and the Repulsor. Uh, many a meme was made about the uh, the seemingly excessive firepower that the Repulsor had, and the model definitely hasn't grown on me like the Redemptor has. I'm still not a big fan of how it looks. But July was a good month if you played from Marine Marines, uh, but not much happened apart from the fate of Kono starting if you were into that kind of thing, uh, which at the time I wasn't. Early August was a very exciting time if you were a hobbyist of a certain age, let's say, uh, because it teased the release of the new Necromunda. Now, I'd personally heard of Necromunda, uh, but no more than that. So I wasn't really moved by the news, but lots of people went out of their minds with excitement. Uh, this month also gave us the thrilling news 
that those of us who enjoy a bit of match play uh, would have to buy another book too. Woohoo! Uh, the announcement of chapter approved did not sit well with me. Um, I don't really see why they can't just release match play updates in an FAQ or errata more than rather than a, a £20 book with loads of filler in. Um, but apart from that, the continuation of the fate of Cornell, apart from the continuation of the fate of Cornell, uh, Orcas didn't really have that much to offer in terms of releases and big announcements. Um, but the end of the month did give us the Primaris Combat Squads and the grossly overpriced and just really not very good uh, Primaris Veteran Sergeant. So August was a bit of a disappointment looking back on it, but at the time I wasn't really bothered by the lack of big releases because I was having a blast playing the edition. Uh, but surely they would have something more exciting to an announce later in the year. After the lack of big releases in August, September immediately compensated and then some with the announcement of another Primark returning to 40k, Mortarian. Of course, this sent the chaos side of the community into overdrive with excitement uh, after they had been starved of releases since the, the waves of Primaris releases. Um, as someone who's never played Chaos and has no real intention of ever doing them in the future, I can't say that I was interested in Mortarian, but I can say I'm a big fan of how the model looks. Um, just not the whole lore of Chaos. Um, the inevitable results of the Fate of Cornwall finally happened this month. Uh, after the alleged fixing of week 5 uh, with an Imperium win, but I, I won't bore you with any more talk of conspiracies in the fate of Corno. Um, the end of the month gave us another big Death Guard release with the announcement of a new model for the legendary Typhus, and to be honest I really dislike uh, this Typhus model, the new one. For me he's just not imposing like a Death Guard Terminator Lord guy, like, it's a really horrible uh, Lord of Contagion or whatever he is, a uh, Chaos Lord. I don't think he, he should, he's not as imposing as he should be. And squeezing in at the end of the month, yet another Death Guard release, the Plague Burst Crawler, which was a big nasty mortar tank. And as with the other Death Guard models, I'm just a, not a great fan of the style of it. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen one on the table, um, so I'm not sure how well they actually sold. So September saw the Chaos community gifted by Nurgle with many new releases. Uh, who would get new models next? Would it be Sisters of Battle? No. October gave Guard players the worst FAQ in the history of ever, as Commissars and Conscripts were nerfed to hell to the point uh, where I've literally used Commissars less than five times, maybe two or three since then. And I, I play almost every week, and I've not used conscripts at all. Um, which I, d I don't think the aim of an FAQ should be to make it so the certain units are unusable in. Not even I don't even play competitively, but they're unusable. Um, Death Guard players were also continued to be gifted to in October uh, by Grandfather Nurgle with the release of multi-part Plague Marines. And apart from that, not a huge amount happened in October. Uh, Eldar got a new Wraith based star collecting, uh, and the Bone Singer and other uh, retro Eldar, guy, Eldar guys got reprints, um, which obviously the Bone Singer especially excited a lot of people because he was such a rare model before. Um, but since I'm not a big Eldar guy, uh, these releases didn't exactly set me alight. So October was again slightly lighter month in terms of releases compared to what we've become accustomed to in 2017. Um, but there were still a few more bits of goodness to come in the final two months of 2017. November saw the release of Necromunda, to which I said meh, but uh, loads of people screamed and ran around. And to be honest, after having a game of it, I'm not really sure what all the hype is about. I don't really see the appeal. Um, I'm just, I don't know what it is about it, but it, I don't like it that much. Maybe the most exciting news in Warhammer ever. Warhammer ever uh, did come in November that Duncan would be getting a friend in the Warhammer TV studio and our lives were thrown into chaos. Would Tooth and Coats still be enough? Uh, spoilers, it's still enough. Um, Armies on Parade also happened in November and I'd never competed in this before and although I knew I didn't have a chance of winning, it really motivated me to get all my Skatari which had been sitting up and painted for months, uh, getting them painted up in time. 
I'd never painted more in my life than in the 20 days leading up to parade day. But in the end, I got it all finished and I got what I thought would be a what I thought was a really good looking display board. I was, I really enjoyed taking part, I'm taking part in Armies on Parade. I loved seeing the amazing uh, parade boards in my local game store. Um, November also gave us the Christmas Battle Forces for 40k and Age of Sigma, and these boxes were really good value, like they always are. Um, each box to me seems to be good for both starting and extending an army, which I think should be the aim uh, of every good box set. And then coming out of nowhere towards the end of the month was some legitimately shocking news to everyone that Sly Marbo would be getting a new model. Um, I've already made a video on the subject of the new model, so I won't ramble on about it. But in short, everyone got really excited. It's a cool model. And it's Sly Marbo. Finally for November, Chapter Approved came out, and I and most people I know weren't bothered about it and didn't buy it. Um, so in the penultimate month of the ultimate year for 40k, um, we made the question everything we knew with the announcement of Sly Marbo and uh, the extension of Warhammer TV to two presenters. But will there be any more surprises lurking in December? Ah, December. Christmas, snow and surveys. Maybe not the snow. Um, but yes, this month Games Workshop put out its big wargaming survey which was something I cannot imagine old Games Workshop doing in a million years. We also got uh, some new gubbins for Blood Angels and Dark Angels Primaris, uh, including some pretty neat lieutenants and some upgrades proved for them. So that uh, was the year in 40k up to the time of writing, uh, not recording, on the 9th of December. It has been an amazing year for the game, and I hope that 2018 can be even better. If you have made it this far into the video, I want to say a huge thank you. Um, a lot of time has been put into this, into making this, writing it and recording it and editing it. So if I really would appreciate it if you like, uh, share it and comment your opinions on this video. I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas if you're watching this before Christmas and a very good 2018 too. Uh, thank you so much for all your support this year. The channel has grown immensely. Goodbye.